I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you all for being here. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. It's great to see everyone and I hope everyone is um, staying safe and healthy out there. Um, I'm really thrilled for tonight's program, um, in part because I'm just so happy to have Katie Woodkirchhoff back with us um, from Shelburne Museum. She has um, trained as a specialist in American art history, decorative arts, and material culture. She holds a BA from Smith College and an MA from Winter Tour Program in American Material Culture and a PhD from the University of Delaware. Katie has worked for a range of museums and cultural organizations, including the American Philosophical Society, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Winter Tour Museum and Country Estate, and is currently the associate cur curator at Shelburne Museum where she researches and organizes exhibitions focusing on the museum's historic collections of American fine folk and decorative arts. And she is currently on an ongoing uh, research project for the forthcoming exhibition and publication of Luigi Lucioni, Modern Light, set to open at Shelburne Museum in the summer of 20, 2022. <laughs> um, it's an absolute delight to have you here, Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, yeah, you know, it's been a crazy year, everyone. And I have to say it is, I am sincerely so glad to see everyone's faces out there tonight. Thank you for taking the time to join us um, and have a conversation about uh, Vermont's painter laureate, as it were. Um, so Gloria came to me a couple months ago and said, you know, what are you working on? Do you have anything that might be useful? And I said, well, actually, um, we've been we've been gearing up for this exhibition. Um, it initially was supposed to hit next summer, the summer of 2021. Um, but with the pandemic, we decided that, you know, like most cultural organizations in the state, we would go back to the drawing board and try to move things around so that we could maximize um, opportunities for people to actually come and see the art when we get it up on the walls. Um, so we've delayed the project a bit, uh, which meant that we also delayed the book, which meant that um, I've been researching this stuff for a long time. And when I finally sat down to put together tonight's uh, lecture notes, I thought to myself, okay, Katie, you need to go back and make sure that you're not regurgitating material from an earlier lecture that you've given. And I realized this is the legit first time um, that I've had a, a sort of formal-ish lecture on, on this topic. Um, so I'm really excited to get to share some of this material with you all tonight. Um, my plan is to um, give a little bit of background about the artist, a little bit of biographical background for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, although I assume that many of you do know a lot about Lucioni, and in fact, some of you may have known the man. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of background on that, a little bit about his sort of artistic training and links to Vermont, you know, who he is, how he got here, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I thought I would share a little bit of material that relates directly to my institution, um, Shelburne Museum, and the kinds of links that the artist had with the institution. And then um, I'm going to share uh, a number of works that relate both to sort of seasonal festivities um, and to uh, your beloved Southern Vermont Arts Center. Um, so I have to send a special thank you out to Anne before we get started because um, without her help, you know, this project um, really wouldn't be realizable in a legitimate way. Um, there is so much of a wealth of extraordinary stuff in uh, the collection down in Manchester. And it really, um, the opportunity to be able to dig into it has been just um, a godsend for someone who enjoys doing research. So um, I thought I would start with that, um, show you some things that you might not have seen, and then we'll have some time at the end of our time together tonight for Q&A. That sounds good. Uh, I will get started and I will share my screen. Let's see if I can do this right. All right, from beginning. Great, I hope everyone can see that. Um, awesome. So uh, the detail that you see here is actually uh, a detail of a painting that is in SBAC's collection that we're gonna talk a little bit about um, in the latter half of today's conversation. Um, so for those of you who aren't immediately familiar with Luigi Lucioni, you might know his name, you might've heard his name, you might've seen one of his etchings. Um, I, wanna, I wanna start by painting a picture of who exactly this guy is, um, who he was. So uh, 
Lucioni was born on November 4th, 1900 in Northern Italy in Malnade. I'm gonna show you a map in a little bit to help you kind of contextualize where exactly that is. It's very Northern Italy. Um, he immigrates to uh, New York, uh, to the United States through Ellis Island in 1911. Um, his father had already come over. Uh, he comes over to join his father with his mother and sisters. Um, and by the time uh, 1915 rolls around, he enrolls at Cooper Union in New York. Um, he realizes that he's got some artistic aptitude and he begins to work to hone those kinds of skills. Um, he settles uh, first, first he, he grows up in New Jersey and New York. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in a few slides about um, how he ends up in Vermont. But before we leave this picture, I want you to take a close look uh, or a, a special notice at least of this work that's in the very back of this uh, portrait. So this is his self-portrait of 1949 in the collection of the Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, and the painting that's hanging this landscape for a long time, I thought it might've been his view of Stowe that's in the collection at the Minneapolis uh, Institute of Arts, but it is not. In fact, uh, it is a painting of his hometown, Lombardy uh, or Melnade in, in Northern Italy uh, that was in his possession until he passes away, passed away in the 1980s. Um, at that point, uh, through a bequest, uh, that object actually entered Children Museum's collection. And it's one of the objects that um, we get to see with some frequency. Um, and so, you know, you, you've got this, this self-portrait of this sort of modest artist in his home studio. Um, or in his home. He's got this kind of very plain shaker-esque cabinet or chest of drawers behind him, this painting on the wall. There's this little hammered copper kind of canteen. Um, and through a conversation uh, with Sharon Kropa, actually, um, I learned that um, this canteen uh, existed for a long time in his house. Uh, there were also other hammered metal objects um, that may have come through his father, who was a coppersmith. Um, so it's it's sort of, you know, these, in the art historical world, we call them attributes, um, but these elements of a person's identity that get added into self-portraits to kind of give some depth about the sitter um, are all over the place in here. There's one more. If you look down in the bottom corner here, you notice two hooked rugs in the background, one right here, right behind him, and then another as uh, that door opens into the next room. Um, and some of you know uh, that I work very closely with the textile collections at Shelburne Museum as well. And I love our hook drug collections, uh, what they tell us and everything. And I believe that, uh, you know, Lucioni, as he got to know Shelburne Museum founder, Electra Habermeyer Webb, um, I, I, I've started to believe that these kinds of hook drugs that show up in his pictures sometimes um, were these kinds of quiet references to some of his patrons and those kinds of things. So we'll get into that a little later, but here's his self-portrait. Um, this next painting is, in fact, that painting that's ha hanging in the background of his self-portrait. So this is the portrait of Norman Lombardy from 1938. Um, Lucini paints this by the time he is uh, living and working in Vermont. Um, and he, he has this really sort of um, interesting comment. Uh, he, he noted that the first time that he traveled to Vermont uh, in the late 1920s, it was, quote, like seeing the mountainsides of my birthplace. I was reborn in this majestic setting and I fell in love with Vermont. Um, so if you take a look at this, the kind of really lovely um, blue tones and hazy distance that you get in this painting. And then uh, you imagine where he's from. So this is a little map of Italy that I promised. Um, and if you take a look right up here, this red star that's just sort of Northwest of Milan in Varese, um, that is roughly where Milnade uh, is located. So that's where Lucioni grew up. So very Northern Italy, almost to Switzerland um, with the Alps in the background, right? Um, just a remarkable kind of landscape to get to know. So this is a photograph of the same region. Um, this, this photograph was kindly shared by uh, the proprietor of Village Wines and Spirits, Kevin Clayton in Shelburne. Um, we collaborated on a conversation about Lucione a couple months ago and specifically had a chance to talk about his, the landscape that he grew up in and how that compared to Vermont. And when Kevin shared his photographs of the wine region, I was amazed, partly because, so this is a photograph, right? This is a painting that Luigi executes in 1941. 
called Vermont Splendor. So this is in a private collection, um, but I just want, I'm gonna toggle back and forth here for just a second because it's kind of magical, right? This is a photograph of where he is from. This is a painting of the place that he moves to and makes home in. Um, and I, I think about um, the, the alignment between the landscape of Luciani's youth um, and the landscape that he eventually, you know, created as his sort of place to be as an adult. Um, you can also see in the distance here, I bet some of you know that little steeple. Um, I believe this is down in Manchester. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are these really lovely sort of um, identifiable aspects of Lucioni's works that um, as someone who's relatively new to Vermont, I really love being able to sort of take a close look at them um, and try to try to put myself into his, into his place. Um, so, but to get here, to get to the 1940s, it's helpful to understand a little bit about where Lucioni was coming from. Um, so this is a portrait of his father. This was painted in 1941. Um, and critics of Lucioni's work uh, were very quick to highlight the photorealistic qualities of many of his paintings. Um, and so when you look at this portrait of his father, the coppersmith, um, you get a real sense of Lucioni's ability to render realistic lifelike details. Um, some of my favorite parts of this painting, I mean, I, I could look at these things for hours. I do look at these things for hours, um, but I love his hands, right? Um, I think about the way that my grandfather's hands looked as he played the piano when I was a little girl. I think about, you know, the ways that, like, objects like hands are very difficult and challenging to render for artists because they are so unique and they reflect the kind of age and wear that a person experiences in their life. They are a testament, right, to the things that you've been through. And so um, when Lucioni's father immigrates, uh, he sets up a home for the family. Um, he was by all accounts, uh, a sort of gruff and very sort of conservative, formal, older Italian man. Um, but he, uh, he, he seems to, to really uh, be embodied in a remarkably human way in this picture. Um, so Luciani paints this in 1941, but before that, he goes through some training. I mentioned earlier that in, uh, when he was just uh, 14 or 15 years old, he begins at Cooper Union. Um, so he begins taking classes there and uh, really sort of honing his abilities as they relate to draftsmanship and composition and anatomy and figural drawing and all those kinds of things. Then in 1926, he receives his first, uh, his first fellowship to the Tiffany Foundation. So for those of you who haven't heard about the Tiffany Foundation, um, it was an organization, it is an organization that was uh, started by Louis Comfort Tiffany. It was housed at his home, which is this big building that you see uh, called Laurelton Hall, uh, located on Long Island. Uh, and it was a place that Tiffany opened to artists to come and give them space to work uh, to give them space to be inspired by both the landscape and the collections. Um, the building was filled with all kinds of incredible decorative arts um, and objects of interest that were perfect fodder for objects like, or for paintings like still lifes and those kinds of things. Um, it also provided a really critical community for Lucioni at a formative time in his life. So he's born in 1900, in 1927, 1926, he's in his mid-20s, and all of a sudden uh, he is thrown into a group of people who are extraordinarily talented and creative artists, um, and the kind of hive mind begins to bubble, right? Um, so this, I'm sorry for the quality of this photograph, um, but it's the, the actual photograph in the collection of the Long Island Museum isn't much better. I thought it was worth showing now because it is a photograph that was snapped of Luigi Lucioni in costume in one of the courtyards at Laurelton Hall. Um, so here you see him sort of voguing for the camera. Um, for a short while, while he was there, uh, rumor has it that he roomed with his friend uh, and fellow artist Paul Cadmus. Uh, Paul's sister Fidelma was there. Um, it was a real sort of heady time if you were interested in being a creative human being. Um, and so this was, this was the place that really, you know, during the 1920s fed Lucioni's creative uh, drivers. 
This portrait, uh, which recently came up for sale at Swan Galleries, um, is a portrait of Luigi's sister Alice that was painted in 1925. And for those of you who uh, are who, who know Luciani's work, you probably see this and think that's really unusual. Um, usually, we think about Luigi as having painted pictures that have a photographic quality, right? Uh, he tends to sublimate his brushwork so that you can't really see where the paint is. Um, his focus, rather than focusing on the texture of paint and how it's applied, is on the subject matter. And um, instead of having you see big chunks of colorful paint in most of his pictures, he instead favors um, a, a really sort of almost glassy finish, finish to most of his, his later works. But in the 1920s, he was experimenting with all kinds of new painting techniques for him, partially fed by his time at the Tiffany Foundation. And this portrait of Alice is a really great representative example of that. Um, sometimes uh, when we have groups in the galleries and we're talking about works like these, um, it almost seems a little impressionistic, right? So chunkier paint, um, a less precise kind of uh, way of handling the canvas and the composition. To put some, some contrast into this, so this is his portrait of Alice from 1925. This is his portrait of the same person from 1947. So we're gonna go back, Alice from 1925 and Alice from 1947. So Alice in Gray in our collection was painted at about the same time that uh, his portrait of his father uh, was painted. And so Lucioni at this point had really entered this, um, this, this mode of painting where he was paying a lot of attention to surface textures. Um, he was paying a lot of attention to his ability to kind of render um, flesh tones uh, really sensitively. I love this beautiful velvet curtain behind his sister. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the other objects in this painting, this table, right, with its sort of rough, um, almost reflective finish here in the corner, these two balls of yarn, and then this pewter uh, uh, tankard with a lid, um, there are these wonderful, there's a wonderful sense of kind of light as it plays over these surfaces and creates a really three-dimensional space. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up these pictures to kind of help folks understand um, what Lucioni, so it's how he sort of came through training and what uh, he eventually, how his practice changed over time. Um, but to get back to his Vermont story, uh, we know that the first, Lucioni's first visit to the Green Mountain State was in the late 1920s. He came to visit a cousin who was working in Gary. And for those of you who know the state, you know that there is an extensive granite industry in Barrie, uh, and that uh, during the early years of the 20th century, as now, uh, there was a large, there is a large Italian American community there. Um, and so uh, Lucioni, in some ways, uh, had a really wonderful way of accessing the state um, and having, you know, a place that he could come to get to know this place uh, where not everything was unfamiliar. Um, this painting is in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum uh, and was commissioned in 1931. Um, and I, I really enjoy looking at this partly because it makes me think about Charles Sheeler. Um, and for my talk today, I wanted to focus on Lucioni's work rather than comparatives, but Charles Sheeler was a, painting, a painter who often uh, is called a precisionist. Um, so his methods of painting focus on the sort of planes, flat planes, um, and the geometry of a landscape. Uh, and I, when I look at this picture, um, you know, the, the precise, you know, way that he has handled these bricks in this building, um, the way that this support system, right, this beam, um, everything is just sort of lined up. It almost, um, this almost reminds me of things like the Brooklyn Bridge, right, these big paintings of support and steel and industry. Um, so this amazing picture, uh, uh, which, which I really enjoy, was painted in 1931, the same year that this very well-known picture of the village of Stowe was painted. Um, so this I mentioned earlier, it's in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And uh, this, is, this is 
arguably the best known view of the state of Vermont um, from the 20th century. Now, there are others that are very famous too. Um, and perhaps I have had my head in the sand with Lucioni for the last few, few years. Um, but it is well known and it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's terrifically iconic, right? You've got this big sort of profile view of Mansfield in the distance, this lovely church steeple right here. Um, and then as the viewer, right, you are invited in through this sort of set of rolling descending hills as you come into town. Um, you get a real sense of scale, you get a real sense of uh, the way that you might approach this little town nestled in the hills. Um, and if you'll think back to those photographs of Northern Italy where uh, Lucioni was from, uh, this is not unlike his home turf. Um, so I wanted to, to share this with everyone um, because it, it really sort of, uh, it becomes a, a very well-known work uh, that Lucioni is identified with really for the rest of his career. Um, and it also is a about this time that Lucioni makes the acquaintance of our museum founder, Electra Havelmeyer Webb. So this photograph that you see, um, it's now at VHS, but it was uh, in the collections of the Aldrich Public Library in Barrie. Uh, this photograph is of the Brick House. Um, and for those of you who have visited Shelburne Farms, um, the Brick House was Electra Havelmeyer Webb's residence that she was gifted uh, as a wedding gift from the Webb family on the property of Shelburne Farms. Um, so, the picture, uh, to sort of orient everyone to this, uh, we are looking towards the west, right? This is the lake out here in back of the house and the Adirondacks in the distance. Um, this over here is the brick house. Uh, and I, I wondered if these are, these might be the lilacs in front of the house. Uh, Electra has had incredible lilacs and peonies. Um, and then you see this, this sort of small building that almost disappears into the sort of middle ground. This little building uh, was the playhouse for Electra Havemeyer Webb's children when they were young. And when they grew up and they moved away, it's at Bankett. Um, but in the late 1920s or early 1930s, uh, we are not really sure when, Electra Havemeyer Webb makes the acquaintance of Lucioni. Uh, he sells a painting at a certain point to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and that could have been uh, the spur that connected the two, um, but it, there is no conclusive evidence of that. Rather, um, Electra gets to know his work. Uh, she's really impressed by his abilities, and she comes to him and asks him to paint a portrait of one of the Bostwick family barns uh, as, a, as a wedding gift for her daughter. And uh, he, he does this. Uh, he also begins painting pictures of all sorts of things in the Champlain Valley. Um, and Electra, offers the space up in this little playhouse uh, to be Lucioni's studio uh, during the summers when he's not in New York. Um, so for the summers during the 1930s, before Lucioni purchases his home and studio in Manchester, um, this was the space that he used at, <clears throat> at the Brick House. Um, now, the, the other aspect of this is, I, I've started to wonder if perhaps, pardon me, if perhaps, um, you know, was he staying in the big house and just painting in the studio? How was this working logistically? I don't know. Um, we did find recently that the studio still exists, actually. Um, it's still out on the property at Shelburne Farms. Um, and while it has been totally changed, um, it, is, uh, it is still extant. And so we're, we're sort of excited about, about the fact that that remains. Um, but this is where Lucioni was painting from for many years uh, until he purchases his own place. Um, and the landscape at Shelburne Farms offered extensive fodder for really, really, you know, excellent compositions. Um, so these two barns, um, this, this picture, uh, the last time I, I was talking about this, um, I didn't know where it is, and I just got an email a couple days ago um, letting me know where it was, in fact, so I could get some good photography of it. Um, but, you know, you see here that uh, the barns are painted not quite in Lucioni's refined photorealistic style. Um, they're still a little rough around the edges, almost like a sketch. Uh, here, I thought I'd include a couple family photos because these are the kinds, kinds of things that are not readily available elsewhere. Um, but this is a portrait of Lila Vanderbilt Webb Wilmerding. Um, so she was one of Electra's daughters. 
photographed on her wedding day in 1935. Um, and in back of her, you'll see the painting Vermont Castles from 1933. Um, from the looks of this, I believe this is inside, uh, inside the brick house here at Shelburne Farms. Um, but you see this painting show up again. Uh, so here it is over the mantel uh, in one of the bedrooms upstairs at the brick house. Um, and here, so uh, this is slightly different, but this is a, an interior shot of one of the family's homes. Um, this one at 740 Park Avenue in New York. And if you look in the corner over here, uh, some of your pictures may be over it right now, but um, this is actually a painting of the brick house uh, that is currently unlocated that Lucioni executed for Electra Webb. So the family ties were really, really strong. And you can see from these interior pictures that Lucioni was painting works that the family appreciated and the family was proudly displaying these, these new contemporary artworks alongside other contemporary artworks by friends like Mary Cassatt. Um, and so it's a really interesting kind of thing, at least for me as a historian, to start to understand how these objects were understood in context. Um, more opportunities at Shelburne Farms arose for Lucioni to paint incredible things. Um, so this is one of the many barns. Um, you know, it's, it's not your average barn, right? It's a 19th century Gilded Age um, barn for improvements. Um, but this is, this is in a private collection. Um, we also see studies like this one. Um, so this popped up as I was researching a couple months ago. Um, and this work from 1934, uh, this is painted uh, just off of the property at Shelburne Farm. So here's a photograph of the same place. And here's that painting. Um, so I, I, I really enjoy being able to sort of match up these locations. For those of you who live in Manchester, right? We, uh, we know that Lucione was a fixture out at the golf course. Um, you often would see him around town uh, with his easel and paints, uh, sort of going after work. And I, I like to imagine him sitting out in back of Shelburne House and painting the scene as well, as well as others. You'll also notice, so in the photograph here, um, there's no bar. There's no sort of bar of sand or rocks. Here there is. Um, the lake level has risen since all of this was painted. Um, and so it's, I suppose it's helpful to know that that's just under the surface. Um, so all of this great inspiration out at Shelburne Farms, um, this painting from 1936 in a private collection called Lake Through the Locusts. Um, for those of you who know the Brick House, you know that this is basically a view off the back veranda. Um, so there are, of course, hay fields in the distance uh, and Lake Champlain and the Adirondacks and these incredible, incredible textured locust trees. Um, many of you know that, uh, or some of you may know that uh, Lucioni, his practice worked in this way. Um, he reported that he would take the summers uh, to, you know, go out into nature and paint. Uh, he would create these really lovely compositions. And then over the winter, uh, he would go back to his studio in New York and he would engrave those paintings uh, to, to have as etchings that could be printed. Um, and so this was the painting, Lake Through the Locusts, uh, from 1936. And this is the related etching of that same composition. Um, and his etchings, I, I'm going to talk a little more about them as we, as we continue today. Um, but the quality of line and um, the kinds of three-dimensional spaces that Lucioni created in these compositions are really, they they are evidence of an incredibly skilled printer. Um, now for many artists who created prints, fine art prints after their work, um, sometimes if you were a painter, if you didn't know how to etch or engrave, you would farm that work out to someone who was skilled in actually cutting a plate. Um, Lucioni, however, perhaps because of his father's background in metalworking, um, he was a skilled uh, uh, printer himself. And so, most of these plates he cut himself. Uh, many of them are copper. Some of them are copper uh, with a steel coating. Um, and we have some that are even stones. We have a, a small collection of the plates at Shelburne Museum that I've gotten to know over the years. And um, they're, they're, really, they're really wonderful to see. Um, so this picture, like through the locusts, uh, was a print from a painting. 
Um, these are, this is another sort of view of uh, the lake from the house. And this, this picture uh, is, it's only about this big. It's really very tiny. Um, it was located in the attic of the brick house at one point and uh, we brought it down and thought, well, well isn't this a lovely thing? Um, and something that I really enjoy about this picture is if you take a look at the screen in front of you with it blown up, um, my eyes benefit from this too, you'll notice the way that he's highlighted these trees with this sort of wonderful bright blue, right? right in here, right in here, to indicate shadow and to provide a little bit of depth and visual interest. Um, even this very small, very, uh, I'm, I'm sure it was a quickly executed composition, has these really interesting elements that pull our eye in and give us a chance to really look closely and appreciate the craftsmanship behind how he was putting these images together. Um, Lugioni maintained this lovely relationship with the family um, for many years. Uh, and in 1940, he painted this uh, still life for the family. I'm going to be talking a lot about still lifes today because they are my very favorite things that Luciani created. And I decided that if I got a soapbox to stand on with you all, I would share the things that I loved the most because hopefully you all will love them too. Um, so this painting uh, is, is really, really remarkable. Um, we had it cleaned uh, sometime within the last 10 years. And the colors that emerged from this incredible chartreuse drape in the background. Um, some of you may be familiar with Lu Lucioni's portrait of Ethel Waters, um, his portrait of Rose Hobart, some of these extraordinarily creative women. Um, he often uses this kind of chartreuse drape in the background, and I don't know why. Uh, I wondered, uh, I see it turn up in, you know, over and over. I don't know if he just liked the color uh, or what the deal was, but I'm, I'm looking for that answer if anyone knows it. Um, the other birds, though, that you see here, this selection of uh, fowl, Electra and her family were all hunters, uh, and they would regularly bring that game you know, to eat. And uh, it, it was it was a great sport. Um, and it was also something that, you know, because of the remarkable textures of all of these feathers, um, the sort of glinting light off this wine glass, uh, and the way that Lucioni has really rendered these sort of crisp folds in the linens. Um, this, for me, is a real tour de force of his abilities as a painter to convey realistic surface textures. Um, and that, that gives me a lot of pleasure as a viewer. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing when I look at still lifes and paintings is if the painting can fool me, if I can feel like I can almost reach out and grab something out of it, um, there, there's something about that that's really magical. And I think Luigi was able to do a great job of that. Um, so, you know, I, I promised in putting together this talk tonight that I would work to put together a little information about some of Lucioni's um, sort of holiday oriented uh, objects. And we have a wonderful collection of prints at the museum that were inscribed as holiday cards uh, to the Webb family. Um, and so uh, both to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Webb and to their son Watson. Um, this particular print is Elms by the Lake from 1937. Uh, and if you are suspecting that this is, uh, this is maybe on Shelburne Farms, uh, you are correct. Uh, we can tell you almost the place where this was painted, or not painted, uh, where this was, it may have been painted first. I don't know, actually. Um, but the place where this image was taken. Uh, so the bottom of this, which may be difficult on your screens to read, uh, it says to Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Webb, Merry Christmas, Luigi. This is from 1937. Many of his prints over the years were inscribed that way. This is a little easier to read. This one's from 1940. It's a view of Manchester that may be familiar to you all. Um, and you know, we were talking, or I was talking a little bit earlier about Lucioni's skill, skillful engraving uh, abilities. And here you get a real sense of the way that he was sort of cutting a plate uh, to create textures through these big billowy clouds in the sky. Um, texture of these mountains, right? And of the, the kind of sense of fast moving clouds and sunlight passing over a landscape. Um, I, I, I could look at these for hours. I have a few more for you. Uh, this, again, if you look at these clouds, they're really uh, 
Um, they almost look like curly hair on the top of these trees to me. Um, this again is inscribed as a Merry Christmas 1941. This, uh, you get a real sense of that barn uh, and the surface of the barn with his cross hatching here. Um, this was from 1946. Um, and something that's sort of interesting about uh, many of Lucioni's prints is that by the mid 1930s, uh, he had begun working with a group called Associated American Artists. Now Associated American Artists, if you haven't heard of them, uh, they were a really interesting organization. They were based in New York City, uh, but they took as their mission the idea that there could be art for every American home. Um, so they worked with artists to create um, additions, fine art prints, um, sometimes textiles, different kinds of objects for the home uh, that would allow the average middle class American like me to have an object by an artist in their home. Um, so Associated American artists began working as the kind of agents for distribution for many of Lucioni's prints. And in the early years, um, he reported that, you know, he had sort of kept close, uh, he had paid close a attention to the number of prints that were being additioned and sent out. Um, and by the time Associated American Artists begins distributing his work, um, it kind of goes off the rails in terms of his additions. Uh, we notice that um, he's not keeping as close a track of things. Uh, and we also notice that sometimes he's reusing prints like this uh, that were cut one year and then sent out as kind of like a holiday or birthday card several years later. So every now and then I'll go into a print shop and I'll notice a print by Luigi Lucioni uh, that in the corner has one date. It's this, this particular one is not dated, but it has one date. And in the signature, there's another date entirely. Um, so we have some evidence that he was keeping these objects um, and then sort of sending them out um, much in the way that we would greeting cards, right? Um, this is a lovely uh, other print of a sissy. So this was from 1955 um, and takes us back to Lucioni's homeland. Um, this one is inscribed at the top to Watson. So Watson was Electra's son, uh, Merry Christmas, 1955. Um, and this, you know, when you evoke sort of classical Italy, um, there are all sorts of associations that come with this. Um, and it, it is remarkable to me, you know, when I look at, like these trees, how much they echo the locusts that we see by the lake, um, and how so many of the structures in these, these prints really go back to these, um, these really uh, well thought through compositional techniques that he's, he's using as he's putting together his, his pictures. Um, so from there, I, you know, it's clear through all of these prints that Lucioni was working really hard to not only create original works that could reach patrons in the form of oil paintings, um, but he was also, you know, getting his work out there and getting a little more exposure um, through the invocation of reproductive prints like this. Um, and this painting, which is a terrific work from 1951 in the collection of the Southern Vermont Arts Center, um, this is one of those works that was translated uh, into print. In fact, here is a photograph from eBay of the December 1951 cover of Country Gentleman magazine, the magazine for better farming and better living. Um, I, I really, uh, I, I always enjoy looking at old magazine covers um, because they help you understand, right, like where people's mindset was at the time. Um, and up here it says how to keep young families on the land, um, an issue that Vermont is still grappling with. Um, tools to save your time. And if you look very closely, um, page 52, there's a little notation that's been made up here. Page 52, try Jersey cows. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there's this sort of wonderful um, objectness about this magazine. Um, and this was not the first time, in fact, that Lucioni had painted a work that was then publicized and used by everyday folks. Um, I, I love the idea of an artist spending hours and hours on a work like this and then 
the sort of mechanical printing press, right? Printing all these copies of this magazine and having this image sent out in the world um, to reach all kinds of new eyes. Um, it's a really important way in American visual culture that uh, we learn about artists, but also that we sort of gather this collective sense of what, um, of what our collective identity is. Um, and so these kinds of holiday images, um, they, they speak to something I, I think that is uh, wonderfully, it, it's sort of a wonderful commonality. Um, so I wanted to show this, and I also wanted to show this other uh, country gentleman cover. This is in slightly better condition from just the month before, November of 1951. And I wanted to read you, uh, I, I don't have a note for uh, the explanatory text for this, but I wanted to read you the explanatory text for this picture, uh, because this would have come out in November, the same month that we experienced Thanksgiving. Uh, and country gentlemen was, was, they were aware of this. Um, so they say, quote, the warmth and abundance of the harvest season glows in this still life of good living by Luigi Lucioni, an artist famed for his brilliant realism. The arrangement, featuring magnolia leaves and pewter with a pomegranate in the foreground, is one that any gifted housewife who lives in the South might prepare as the day of Thanksgiving approaches. I should let you all know, I did grow up in the South and we do use a lot of magnolia leaves. Actually, it was set up by Lucioni in his New York studio, where he paints when he is away from his home in Manchester, Vermont. Country Gentleman featured one of Lucioni's Vermont landscapes on its cover in August 18, or 1946. Readers who would like to see other examples of his work will find them from coast to coast. Now, this wasn't, uh, this, this wasn't a lie. At this point, Lucioni had works in major collections. Um, in the early 1930s, he sells his first painting to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, they trade that painting out two, uh, two years later for another still life. Um, so the original painting that was accepted was a, a still life called Dahlias and Apples, which some of you may know recently came up for sale over in New Hampshire. Um, and the painting that it was traded for was a painting called Pears with Pewter. Um, but these still lifes uh, really loom large in Lucioni's creative output, um, which makes my job really lovely um, because they are things that I like to look at. And so here, you know, you have this kind of reference to um, heirloom corn, you have these, this wonderful bowl of fruit, um, and I, I always enjoy when an artist takes the time to paint the imperfections of the objects in front of them, you know, the slow decay of a banana. <laughs> This particular banana would be right about the speed that I like to eat them, right? Um, these grapes, you can tell that some of them are starting to dry up just a little bit. Uh, these wonderful surfaces, the shiny surfaces of those magnolia leaves, he's got them just right. Um, and the fact that uh, he had this sort of ongoing relationship with Country Gentleman, I think really speaks to not only the appeal, the broad appeal of his work, um, but his... Uh, his street smarts in terms of um, how he was able to make sure that his work was getting out there. Um, something that I don't mention so much in today's content, um, but that we can talk about uh, during the Q&A if you're curious, is he had this extensive relationship with Associated American Artists where not only was he issuing the etchings, but he also was issuing these color prints uh, called collotypes that were, um, they were meant to look like watercolors. They were even finished with a special kind of glazing that made them look like a watercolor in raking light, um, which is so interesting. Um, so this is another cover for us. Um, and at this point, I wanna transition a little bit to a conversation about some of his still lifes because um, I know uh, if you have a chance to make it down to the Southern Vermont Art Center, there will be some works there that you'll see that will just blow you away. Um, but there are some others that are a little further afield that I really love uh, that you might not get to see. So one of those, a very early one, um, and perhaps one that was painted um, while he was in residence or at least um, thinking about Tiffany Foundation, is this still life with telephone uh, from 1926 in the collection of the Huntington Museum out in Los Angeles. Um, so this painting, for those of you who are art history buffs, um, you may know, uh, so I mentioned Charles Sheeler earlier when talking about the idea of precisionism, but there's a really incredible self-portrait 
by Charles Sheeler, who was a, uh, a contemporary of Lucioni's, and they were probably associated, um, which is called Still Life with Telephone. Um, and I have wondered often when I look at this particular painting, if there was a kind of conscience re referencing um, between the artists. I also, um, I love that the inclusion of an object like this, um, it makes you think about an artist's sensory engagement with the space around them. Um, now, I will readily admit that what I've been writing about for the last year or so is the sensory experience of Lucioni's still life paintings. Um, so where are the opportunities for us to sort of explore the ways that Lucioni was experiencing his world through his painting? Um, I, uh, I, I, I was reading about Lucioni's um, sort of background and uh, over the last couple of years, I feel like I've gotten to know him um, in, in some ways. And the picture that has emerged in my mind is really one of um, a fairly conservative, um, not necessarily outgoing painter. Um, and for those of you who knew him, I hope you'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, but someone who lived a fairly uh, almost ascetic existence. Um, when you hear from his friends about him experiencing the world around him, um, this is a, an interesting quote uh, from his friend Joseph Kona. Uh, he said, quote, Luigi's frugality, I feel, was derived from early hardships and discipline. I remember how he used to rile at the cost of taking a taxi. He absolutely would not submit to it. However, he would deliberately shun his economic self-interest and go into a gourmet fruit shop to buy a beautifully turned pear to use as a part of a still life setup. But he would be sure to paint the pear first before it got too ripe so he could still eat it. Um, so there are these wonderful sort of insights into how Lucioni was sourcing these objects, what he was painting, why he was painting these things. Um, the following year, um, you see his techniques start to refine a little bit, right? This is 1926. We're still a little fuzzy around the edges. Here in 1927, this lovely still life with checkered tablecloth uh, in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art is, uh, I think he's sort of moving, he's on his way to refining that kind of um, way of painting that he would become known for, his sort of technique and style. Um, and something else you'll notice about his still lifes is that many of them take this really sort of severe angle. What do I mean by that? Um, so if you, if you take a look at this and you imagine where you would stand uh, as a viewer within this space. Um, as a viewer, you're sort of floating up a little bit above this table, looking down at this very kind of intense angle. Um, and it's, it's a, a compositional technique that actually uh, was practiced fairly broadly by um, Cezanne. And Cezanne was a painter who, and Luigi mentioned artists who he really looked up to um, Cezanne and particularly Cezanne's still lifes. Um, it was a, a really conscious sort of art historical reference for him. And so when I think about his early career and the kinds of associations he might have wanted his patrons to make with his work, um, I've often wondered if these kinds of really sort of severe raking angles are a conscious nod to French painting of the 19th century. Um, this other really lovely picture, Arrangement in White from 1928, lives out in Lincoln, Nebraska. And again, you have that sort of unusual and settling angle. Um, but here, you're starting to get those really terrific surfaces again, right? So look at this papaya with this sort of shine on the side of it. It gives it this wonderful kind of depth, right? You can almost taste it. The fuzziness of the peach, uh, the sort of cool water that might be in here. Um, this plum over here on the side of the, of the table, all on top of this crisp white cotton. Um, this is a painting that uh, has been really occupying my brain lately. It's called Americana and it's from 1930. Um, it's a little sharper than what you're seeing in person. I've been having a tough time getting a good image of it, but for the purposes of today's conversation, it's, it's just fine. Um, and one of the things that's really been interesting me about this is uh, why he would have called this Americana. Um, so, so Merriam-Webster defines Americana as, quote, materials concerning or characteristic of America, its civilization or its culture broadly, and things typical of America. Um, so think about it, right? If you are an Italian-American who has come to America, uh, 
right around the time. So in 1929, there's this economic thing that happens, right, that really sort of throws the country um, into a difficult place. Um, it wouldn't be until 1935 that the Works Progress Administration would begin all sorts of uh, work projects for artists. Um, but in 1930, when Lucioni paints this particular still life and names it Americana, I, I think it's important. Um, what you're looking at here, believe it or not, are a, uh, a, a variety of Native American, uh, I'm sorry, a, a variety of objects from Native American cultures from different geological or geographic regions, including a Tlingit oyster catcher rattle with a raven's head, a spoon carved from horn, a ceramic jar from the San Ildefonso Il Pueblo and a bison horn from the plains, all arranged on a sealskin blanket. So when I look at this picture and I think about the fact that there is an Italian American painting a picture of American things that are in fact indigenous things, it does something really interesting to the way that we think about the idea of America, right? Um, something else in this picture uh, that I I think Luigi may have been going toward. Um, when I look at this big pieced sealskin blanket, I see a Dresden plate quilt. Now, I spend a lot of time with textiles and I would welcome any argument that comes that tells me that I'm sort of off my rocker. But this bit in here looks to me almost like a pieced quilt. And I believe that if Lucioni is starting to sort of get involved with collectors and patrons who were deeply sort of interested in other kinds of American art and objects. Um, this would be an interesting way to have a conversation about turning objects on their head. Um, so we can talk more about that if you would like later. Um, this, this might be my favorite still life by Lucioni. It's fairly early, it's from 1934. Um, and I love the, the kind of sense of bright citrusy zest that you get from this. Um, also, all of the incredible work here to delineate the lace and these wonderful sort of designs on this cloth that's over the table. Um, for me, and, and again, you see this sort of wonderful um, chartreuse drape that showed up in that painting from 1940 of the fowl with glass of red wine. These paintings, um, they are delightful and delectable. And um, what always strikes me about them is that I feel like I can taste them or feel them, you know, the, this last, last image, you know, this is a, a coiled pot that would have been formed with hands. Um, and you can almost feel the textures of the fuzz and fur on this blanket. Um, with this, you can almost, you know, you get a sense of the tang of that zest. Um, with this work, a related rhythm from 1958, um, I, I love the sort of reflections in this in this globe here. Um, and I also thought it was worth interesting or worth mentioning to you all um, that in addition to this kind of interest in taste and texture and all these other kinds of sensory ways of experiencing objects, um, Lucioni was, as some of you know, a huge opera fan. Um, he was uh, hooked. Uh, after attending his first uh, opera in the, I believe in 1919. Um, but he would hold weekly listening sessions at his apartment in New York, uh, where his friends could come and listen to rare recordings from the Metropolitan Opera. Um, he also would sort of play these sort of trivia games um, having to do with, with those recordings where, you know, you'd have to sort of guess where the excerpt was from. Um, but I, as I've studied his still lifes, uh, I've started to pay attention to many of the, the titles that reference musical, uh, musical topics. So this is related rhythm. Um, oh, I wasn't gonna show you that quite yet. I think I took out Andante in yellow, um, but there are all sorts of these, these images that really evoke the idea of sound um, and all those kinds of things. So I promised I would share a couple of works you might not have seen from the Southern Vermont Art Center. This is one of them. It's very seasonal. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the great joys of getting to visit Anne and to see their collection is that uh, in their storage, they have um, a number of these sort of one note still life works. Um, and there are three that I wanted to share with you all to conclude tonight. Um, and, and a quote to go along with this one because it really, 
there's something about this that just really rings true to me. Um, Lucioni's friend, Albert Lanuel commented, quote, he spoke often of his impoverished youth, though he never pampered himself with any luxuries, even when his financial condition permitted. The candies, cakes, and sweets were never purchased. They were frequently offered by friends and guests, and he enjoyed them with great enthusiasm. He was frugal and thrifty, making do with mended jackets, trousers, and socks. Um, and so I think about the ways that objects like this candy cane might have come into Lucioni's sphere, right? Did it get dropped off by a friend? Was it something left over after a party? You know, I, I don't have answers for that, but um, there is a kind of intimacy to these small portraits of objects that um, I, I just can't get enough of. And so in the spirit of the season, I thought I would also share this one, Holly in a Bottle from 1976. And I just love, you know, they're sort of marked down here. There's a little signature and a date, um, but just, you know, just the barest bit of Holly. And finally, um, while no one can stand under it together these days, um, a little bit of mistletoe from 1978. Um, so on that note, my time is about up, um, but I'd be happy to open the floor for uh, questions and uh, go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm thinking that it might, um, maybe if you could take down your, your slides. I know oh, it's, it's so pretty and I'd like to keep it up, but it's, oh, it's okay. harder for me to see people here. Okay, great. So um, that was wonderful. Um, I, a lot of, lot of those paintings I had never seen before and it, it was just amazing. And a lot of them, um, seem seems so so realistic it was it was incredible yeah yeah his paintings his way of rendering objects um i i just it's not often that as a historian you get to work on objects that you you find deeply moving um i really love his work uh so all of this has been a pleasure <laughs> um let's see no questions yet um I I'm almost wondering, um, it might be easier for people to just speak if they, it's, it's not, it's not a, um, tremendously huge audience. So, okay. so if you have a question, um, maybe unmute yourself. Um, I have a question or part of a response. Hi, is this Terry? It is. Hi, okay. Guys. Um, I had the pleasure of hanging the show, the um, Luigi, uh, his work in his gallery. And it was beautiful to see all the pieces um, up close because I had not seen them up close. And the joy of actually arranging them. His etchings are amazing. The, the fun part of looking at each element, because I'm a, a print maker, so extreme artist in a, um, et did etching, so I appreciate all that stuff. But to look at the level of detail and the self-portrait, you talked about the, the painting that was in the upper corner. I asked him very, I was like, where is that? Because most of his paintings have a little smidget that's like an element of a, of a, of a place. So, and I think that many of the things that we, um, that I, the etchings of, some of the trees, their their studies of components, and I now I wonder, looking at the the, the Shelburne Farms um, images, that they may be part of that series that he did up on up at um, the Web Estate. But it was um, so the questions are, I, I sorry, I don't really have any questions so much that it's just, um, it's uh, pretty amazing. His work is spectacular. Yeah, I, I really agree. And your passion for the prints, um, it's... Uh, oh, the portraits? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The portraits that he did were spectacular. And over the course from, um, I think it was um, from 23 to, ooh, eight, I don't know, it was a little further on, but the progression and the different types. So I'm sorry, I'll be quiet now. Oh, no, no, no. I, you know, the conversation is, is one of the reasons that I keep coming back to do things with you all. Um, so you're right. His, his portraits are incredible. Um, and uh, he is an artist that 
I've often found that if, if you are a printmaker, um, my, my friends who are interested in printmaking are really attracted to his work because there's such a great variety um, of uh, approaches that he took to his compositions. Um, it's, it's really beautiful stuff and uh, it's, I, I, I'm excited. I hope I get to come down to Manchester to see the show. Oh yeah, you have to. Well, you don't have to, but we'd love to have you. <laughs> Um, there was a question in the chat box. Um, did Lu Luciani have a family? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, he had a family. Um, if by family, you mean uh, he, he was raised by his mother and father. Um, and then when he moves to Manchester, when he purchases his home and studio, um, he lives with his sisters, uh, Alice and Aurora. So he never marries. Um, he never uh, has children. Um, and in fact, when he passes away in the 1980s, um, it was his executor who uh, sort of distributed the collection to regional institutions. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the great um, pleasures of, of doing this research, so there's no way for any of you to know this, before I came to Shelburne, I used to work on like 18th century things. And so the people and objects that I worked on, like they were definitely not around anymore. And it would have been very difficult to get a kind of real time perspective on, you know, what Benjamin West was like as a human being. Um, but a couple months ago at the start of this pandemic, I had the great pleasure of having a full conversation with Sharon Kropa uh, about uh, his home in Manchester and um, sort of, you know, what daily life was, was like there um, from a, from a non-art perspective. Um, and those kinds of perspectives are really helpful for getting to understand um, what someone's daily life is like and how that manifests in their work. Um, so Sharon shared a little bit with me about, um, you know, this sort of large garden that was out front um, and the dinner conversations that they would have. And, um, you know, through resources like uh, that great 1968 um, Vermont PBS film. Uh, if those of you, if there are some of you who haven't seen this, uh, it's a really great resource. You can Google it. Um, and I'd be happy to share the link if, if it's something that people are interested in. But, um, you know, Lucione talked about how he woke up every morning and played his piano for an hour and um, had this kind of regimented uh, pattern for daily life. And especially now that we're all sort of coping with, you know, the new normal with this sort of pandemic reality, um, that, that idea of routine I think is, is really lovely. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you wanna add anything, Sharon, but um, it's the depth of your insights have been really helpful for me. Okay, Sharon. Okay, can I talk? Am yes. I on? Yes. <laughs> um, I have to say, Katie, you're, this has been the most real presentation. You know, I just love how you've captured all, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to express it, but you have just done such a great job of um, capturing what Luigi was really like and showing, I don't know, things that I hadn't known before. <laughs> so it was wonderful. Um, yeah, his, his house is in the paintings. I jotted down a couple things, and some a lot were paintings I had never seen before. But some, you know, where there were like, oh, that that piece of furniture was in our dining room, and like that. Um, well, it doesn't matter. But um, anyway, and the wall behind some of the paintings was in the dining room of the Manchester house, and the father's portrait, which you probably knew that, was in the studio of the Manchester House. That was where that was. That. You didn't know. <laughs> um, and that fireplace, you know, unfortunately, that house is not from us, but that house is in foreclosure now and is moldering and it is heartbreaking. So if anybody has a lot of money and wants to buy a Luigi Lucioni house. I don't even know if, I don't know how that would happen. I have the money, but. <laughs> I have no idea. But it, it's just sort of like, we drive by every now and then and it's like, oh, this is just too bad. But anyway, that's not what this is about. Um, but there a lot of the things were, were there. 
you know, when we lived there. So um, anyway, that's all. If you can ask questions if you want, but that's all I have to say. You did a great job. So Sharon, Sharon, I'm curious as to what, what your um, connection to this project is. To the project. Well, we were, we were friends of Luigi's and um, lived in his house after he passed. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, for about 10 years, but we knew him for a long time before that. And his sisters, and we were friends. We've been to New York. We've been to his studio where he held those opera soirees. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, anyway, I just, um, yeah, it's just great what you've done, Katie. Oh, Thank thanks. Well, it's, you know, one of the joys of this um, has been just getting to know folks, um, you know, this is, we moved to Vermont five years ago and I had no idea what I was getting into, um, but it has been really lovely to see people come out of the woodwork um, with information and, you know, really helpful insights about some of these ideas. Um, some of the conversations that I had with you earlier this spring have really been helpful in terms of like redirecting some of the questions that, that we're asking. Mm -hmm. um, and as we approach this exhibition project for 2022, we're really trying hard. You know, there have been um, half a dozen solo exhibitions of Lucioni's work since he passed away, some of them bigger than others, um, some of them flashier than others. But our goal with this upcoming project is going to be um, to really recast him as, uh, as a meaningful uh, sort of part of America's art scene in the early 20th century, well, sort of during the whole 20th century. Um, but he's, he's especially, so many of his peers, people like Paul Cadmus and Jared French, um, you know, he, he was keen to get to know many of the artists who were working up here in Northern New England, people like Paul Sample. Um, something that's sort of interesting, when I first started at Shelburne, you know, we, we had this large collection of works by Lucioni, but also a large collection of works by Octon Pleisner, both artists who were associated with the Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, and uh, I kept, I, I would like read object files on the two artists. And when I would read about Lucioni, I learned about how when his, you know, um, Dahlia's with Apples was purchased by the Metropolitan, it made him the youngest living artist to have a work acquired by the Met. That lasted for just a couple months because just a couple months later, Ogden Pleisner, who was just a few years younger than Lucioni, sold his first painting to the Met. Um, and so there's this, you know, I've been really curious about the, the sort of working methods of folks uh, down at the Art Center, how people were interfacing within these sort of communities in Northern New England. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been kind of a wild ride, but a good one. So there's, um, I have some questions in the chat box. Uh, where was his home and studio in Manchester? Well, I don't know. It's, am I on speaker? Yes. Um, yes. It, it's on uh, Boulder Road, which is off of East Manchester Road. It's um, just before, if you're starting from the post office in Manchester, the, the road goes off to the right just before you go through the underpass of Route 7, New Route 7. So okay. it's, the, it's the only house. It's on the right. It's a red barn and a kind of a pinkish white house. So not, not far from Pleissner's house. No, they were it, originally, it was on the same road. Mm -hmm. um, the Ro Boulder Road, which wasn't named that at the time because we named it, us and our neighbor <laughs> aimed, named it that when they named the roads. But it was a road that went and it crossed the stream and then went up to Pleisner's. At one point, they closed off the road. They took the bridge off that crossed the stream and it just became a, a dead end, Boulder Road. And Pleist, to reach Pleisner's now, you would go up, pass through the underpass, take that first road and then make a left. So yeah. originally it was on the same road. And uh, okay. yeah. Interesting. Uh, um, so another question for you, Katie, have you found evidence of his use of photography in his work like Rockwell? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes. Well, 
sort of. Um, we, I have seen from some of the materials that Sean Harrington has shared at Manchester Historical um, that there are photographs in his, you know, in his materials that seem to link to compos like known compositions. Um, something else that um, Sean shared with me are some of the sketchbooks and things that are that are in their collection, and it's interesting because that's not a part of the of ephemera related to Lucioni's working methods that we have at Shelburne Museum. Um, we, we just don't have anything like that. Um, so it was really interesting to get to see some of those early sketchbooks. Um, we, we do have some of the early anatomical drawings and things like that from either the National Academy or Cooper Union, but um, yeah, he, I don't, I don't have evidence that he was working as much from photographs as say Pleisner was. Um, but I get the sense that he probably was. Now, in terms of the still lifes, um, I've, I've really wondered if maybe those were, were painted, um, you know, on the spot. Uh, I, I don't know for sure. So we're, we're still, I guess the jury's out on that. Maybe that's the best way I can answer that. We're working on it. And if you find evidence uh, that you think indicates he was working with photography, that would be great. Something that's related and where my brain went when you initially asked the question. Um, so Ogden, or not Ogden Pleisner, oh, Luigi Liccioni was uh, close friends with a photographer named Carl Van Vechten. Um, so that may ring a bell with some of you. Um, Carl Van Vechten was a legendary um, personality during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he had a huge townhouse in Harlem where he uh, would host parties of all sorts of, you know, creative people, artists, uh, performers, singers, writers, um, uh, you know, all, all sorts of interesting people. And Van Vechten and Lucioni were close. In fact, uh, I had some time to go through some of the files that are at the Vermont Historical Society. Mm, I think it was last winter now, it's been a while. Um, but one of the most interesting things uh, was a folder full of correspondence between Van Vechten and Lucioni. Now, I only have the material, I could only see the materials that were coming into Lucioni, right? Not the materials he was sending out because those went to someone else. But um, Carl Van Vechten, uh, who was actually the person who took that iconic black and white photograph of Lucioni that you often see reproduced, um, Van Vechten would walk down the street and sort of take these beautiful black and white photographs of you know, a spun sugar Italian wedding cake or an incredible angle of an outdoor sculpture or something like that. Uh, and he would turn them into postcards and send them off to Luigi. Uh, and their correspondence in the cards is very friendly. Um, it is really being able to see those pictures and that correspondence between Van Vechten and Lucioni. Um, it did a lot to really like humanize the artist in my mind. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that kind of very personal, very intimate correspondence. Um, so, but uh, other than that, I don't know much about the photography. We're still working on it. Yeah, I, I have a question, Ellie. Sure. Because, you know, you, you mentioned the, the banana that seemed to be in a slightly um, decaying state. And you know, when you look at the meticulous way he painted, you can't imagine all that fruit is going to stay fresh and all those lemons are going to be zesty, you know, after a couple of weeks. So yeah. I wonder whether he had something that would, you know, as the peach lost its shape uh, that he had my something, something that he could refer to, to get it the way he, re, you know, the way it originally was. I know Cezanne would paint, you know, s scenes that went forever, but his, his, his still lives don't look realistic. I mean, they, <laughs> They're very um, geometric, uh -huh. uh, and the apples don't have a shine the way Lucioni's do, and that sort of thing. So, um, and the way the folds work are almost so so precise that you you wonder what what grab them. But but on the other hand, when you use a photograph to take a still life, the camera lens gives you some distortions, the um, the, the bend of the lens. And I saw in his the sh 
pictures you showed, very strong verticals, mm -hmm. that wine bottle and the telephone, uh, the black telephone were not tipped like you often get in a, in a uh, photograph. So wow. that leads me to believe that it's done from looking, but then there, there are parts, you know, the, the shine on those magnolia leaves. <laughs> I'm not sure you can just sit there and get, get that just right the first time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I just wonder that there may be some back and forth and, and Pleisner and Rockwell, and they all were using, um, you know, photographs just like. So, yes, um, I, I think that, um, and I, I think you've broken up a little bit. Um, I hope I'm not speaking over you, but you're, you're right. And I, I, I think uh, when we look at Lucioni's peers and we see how they were using, you know, easily available technologies to make their process um, more straightforward, I think it stands to reason that Lucioni, who was so good at recycling his compositions through printing, um, both through sort of, you know, fine art printing and also printing for a more general audience. Um, I think it stands to reason that we would have every reason to expect that he would also be using those kinds of um, artistic aids. Um, there's, and there's, there's no shame in that. <laughs> no. Okay, Katie, there, uh, there's a question here. What would you say he was best known for, etching, still lifes, or portraits? Wow. So in getting to know him around the state, uh, I think his etchings uh, really, really stand out. Um, and at, as someone who works at a museum, right, I'm interested in understanding the ways that artists communicate with uh, their audiences, and I'm interested in evaluating how effective they are um, using whatever means they're using. And when I moved to Vermont, I was immediately struck by this conversation that was just sort of bubbling about Lucioni. Everybody seemed to know who he was. Um, everybody seemed to have a sense of those prints. Um, uh, you know, I, I watched the auctions done at Merrill's and you know, every sale, there's a print or two that come up. Um, and then when I started reading about the artist, uh, I, I would read these period critiques by, uh, you know, the, the art critical press, and they would really take Luciani to task for all of these, all of these prints he was creating and throwing out everywhere as if it was sort of, you know, lowering the status of fine art. Um, now, for someone like me, um, I'm a, a historian who works with material culture. I like to think about all the different kind of objects in our world and how they shape the way that we move through it. Um, and from that perspective, these incredibly beautiful and varied prints, um, and you know, there are just so many of them. It's a voluminous body of work. Um, I, I think if I had to sort of take one aspect of his oeuvre to sort of be the most meaningful from a public face, I think it's probably those prints. Uh, although I don't know if many art historians would, would agree with me on that front. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize how an artist shares their work with people. Um, Kathy, um, Kathy, I think sent a um, message directly to you in the chat feature. I can't see it, oh. so. Oh, let's see. Oh. Hi, Kathy. Sorry about that. Oh, and I've got a couple of these. Let's see. So Kathy says, um, I have a copy of a painting he did of a building I know in 1939. I have never been able to find the real painting. How do I go about finding it? That is a great question. Um, so if you're interested in researching Lucioni, there are a couple of resources that are very helpful. And I'm going to show them to you right now. Hang on. All right, so let's see. First, um, you can tell I'm in writing mode around here. Um, the largest compendium about Lucioni is this book. Uh, it, is, it was published by Stuart P. Embury. It's called The Art and Life of Luigi Lucioni. Um, so this you can still purchase. Uh, if you Google the title, The Art and Life of Luigi Lucioni by Stuart Embury, 
Um, this was the, the start at a catalog resume. Um, and what does that mean? So a catalog resume is a catalog of, or a listing of all of the known paintings by an artist. Um, so this book has a number of biographical resources in it, um, but it also lists uh, all of the paintings that he executed or that were known um, sort of in the 80s when this was put together. Um, there is another guy that I don't have here that is a, a complete listing of all of his etchings, um, although it's not illustrated. And so, you know, there's kind of a challenge with that. Um, there are also a couple of other really wonderful publications. Um, this one, which is if you go down to SVAC, I think this may be the one that Anne has. Um, so yeah, this is a great resource with lots of good pictures. Um, the other one uh, is a publication that came out of the Middlebury Museum of Art um, called Pastoral Vermont, the paintings and etchings of Luigi Luccioni. Um, and if you call the museum, um, I believe they have some of these left. I don't know what their stock is like. Um, but anyway, those are the kinds of four resources that I use when I try to like go to the mat to think about a work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Did you say you had some other questions in your? Oh, let's see. So I think I've got some that went to ever. I think that was the only one that was private. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, somebody had asked about the, the birch trees, painting of birch trees. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't talked that much about his birch trees. I spent most of today thinking uh, more about his earlier work. Um, but his birch trees play a huge role in uh, his work in Manchester. Um, as many of you know, you know, he would set up on the golf course um, and paint the same trees over and over again um, in new combinations. And in a lot of ways, he, uh, he sort of gave those trees personalities, right? Um, Often, you know, he would paint like the three graces. Um, he also has these, these paintings near the end of his life like fair, excuse me, farewell to the birches, um, which is a, a really beautiful um, composition. I think that's in SVAC's collection as well. Um, so anyhow, yes, he painted these birch trees uh, and he, you know, one of the things that I really love about them is his attention to the detail of the bark. Um, it's the same thing with the locusts uh, out at Shelburne Farms. He was just able to really capture um, a real sense of sort of texture and volume in a way that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a real challenge to do. And I, I think he was a talented, uh, he had a talented hand at it. And thank you, Katie, for yet, yet another wonderful lecture with us. Um, we learned so much. Um, I had some comments that, you know, people had never heard of him before. So th this is, this is what we like to, you know, Hi. let, let people learn about something new. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for this. Um, and I also, I also want to thank everybody for joining us uh, tonight. And be sure to get up to the Southern Vermont Arts Center and, and see their see their exhibit. Um, so have a good night, everybody, and um, we'll see you soon. Cool. Join us next week. Bye. Good night.